All right, I'll tell you what the error was. It was simple. Before I do, I would like to uh, thank my daughter for giving me the coal that I have. So this has now been immortalized. So it'll be on YouTube, so I can ask her to look at that. All right. This on yours, I had put in here, invalid, miles driven. Uh, we had equals true, and it should be equal false. So that shouldn't be reset the flag to true. It should be reset the flag to false. It was true to begin with. So even though we were putting in something valid, we were tell we were invalidating it by putting in the wrong value there. All right. So what I want you to do, if you just stop for a second and look up here, I want to make sure this is a flag. This is our local variable that's going to indicate miles driven. As long as we've got something invalid, we're going to ask them to re-enter. Once they re-enter, we're going to validate it to make sure that it's numeric and it's between 1 and 1,000. If it's not, we keep them in this particular loop here. Once it is valid, we take our flag that was valid, invalidate it, which gets us out of the loop, we return this, and we're done. Does, that, does what's going on in there make sense? All right. And the reason I'm telling you that, and I'll go right back and I'll put that up in just a second, but all I did for the next program, or the next function, is I changed everything that says <clears throat> gallons used, I ch or, or I'm sorry, uh, miles driven, I changed it to gallons used. It's the same routine. Now, instead of 1 to 1,000, it's 1 to 100, but the stuff is the same. So now, and again, I'm going to go right back to it, so don't worry about it. But now, if I go out and I grab that alert, I'm going to just grab that, move it down one. And now, both of these should be okay. <clears throat> Plus, Ideally, now, when we run this, all right, we'll just leave the default. So 10, 100, and 10. What's that? I don't know. We'll, we'll look at it in a second. But the point is, do you see that? My numbers are in there. So I know when I put valid numbers in that those first two routines work. All right, I'll take your question in, in, as soon as we go back to the code. Oops. Now where? Oh, up here? Yeah, yeah we're, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, because what I want to do is I'm writing a routine, then I'm uncommenting it. Okay. Because right now if I call that, I'm going to get an error message. Because, or I'll stop or whatever, because the routine doesn't exist. Okay. That's why I'm commenting all those out. But again, does everybody understand that this routine right here, this whole routine, this miles driven is exactly the same as the gallons used, except that instead of saying miles driven, we're saying gallons used. Again, I'll leave that up there for just a minute. Once you, you get it done and it appears to work and you're happy with it, then you could take everything that's in here from the function line to the line down here, copy it to the clipboard, paste it in right below it, and change everything that says miles driven to gallons used, and change the MD to GU for gallons used. Because then all we've got left is the calculation, which is one line, and then displaying it. That's all that's left. All right? Again, I'm going to give you the hard copy. So if you're working on it, you're like, geez, I'm working on this so hard, and for some reason nothing's working, you'll be able to go back and take a look at it. All right?
Can I move this up a little bit so I got the second while loop here at the top, like this? All right. I just want to make sure you can read it. I don't know if you looked on Thursday when that gentleman was here working on the um, on the projector. He had it looking really nice. I mean, you could read it. I don't know what's happened since the time he did that. Now I don't have a clue. Supposedly he's coming back, I think, Wednesday, the way it sounded. And the whole problem, if you look up here, this was supposed to be mounted. It's either an inch higher or an inch lower than it is. And that's what's screwing everything up. This isn't mounted the same size as the one in the next room because they don't have any problems over there. <clears throat> I asked them why they couldn't mount it up there because that's, that's where I used to teach. That's where it was and then there was no problem. He said that the walls won't handle it. That ceiling won't. And I said, well, right now, every time you shut those, the door, the thing moves a little bit. I said, how do you fix that? He goes, the only way we can fix it is to totally redo the room and have it shine over there. And they're not going to do that. They're not going to redo this room. <clears throat> so we have to live with what we have. Now, ideally, again, ideally, you've pretty much got that routine done because if you look up on the screen, I'll, I'll go back, but just if you look up on the screen, again, all I did in this next routine here, all I did was I changed every miles driven to gallons used, and I called it GU here. It's the same routine. What's really nice is the next routine that we have, our uh, calculate miles per gallon, one line. The routine after that to display everything, one line. So once we get this done, we have two more functions to write that are just one line each of actual code. And then we're done. I'm going to give you the code for this as soon as we get done, and I'm going to give you the code for the other two of these that we're going to go over after this. All right? And maybe it'll be better for you to, to not even type, to just watch as I go over it, unless you're typing and you're having very few problems. All right. Now, my hope is that everybody has this first one pretty much done. All right. And I will tell you, if, if you're like, yeah, I got it done, but I just keep making this, this stupid little error or this stupid little error, that's what uh, being a programmer is about, is being able to fix those stupid little errors. All right? Is it making a little more sense going over it like this? All right, that's why I'm trying to do that and then intersperse asking you some questions. All right. Now, if you look up on the screen here, as far as what's left, we've got these two things, right? We've got the calculate MPG, and, and if you look up on your screen, on the screen here, I didn't need to put MPG there. I don't know why I did. That was just stupid. I just, all I need is miles and gallons. All right, so please change yours. If you've got miles, comma, gallons, comma, MPG, just change it to miles, comma, gallons. All right? We're going to do that. We're going to do the display results, and then we're going to come in and talk about this because the question got asked about that, so we'll, we'll talk about that too. So this is pretty easy to calculate miles per gallon. He goes, well, you're going too fast. Well, take a look. Function. Calculate miles per gallon. Return miles 
divided by gallons. And why don't we just do a dot two fixed on it right away? Guess what? That's the whole routine. That's it. There is nothing more to it. I like that. It's a nice, small, little routine. And now, and I'll come right back to it, but now I should be able to uncomment this one. And now I should be able to come down and move my alert down again. I've got miles driven, I've got gallons used, plus Now let's see what happens when I run it. I'll just keep the defaults, 100, 10. And there's my miles driven, there's my miles, or my gallons used, and there's my miles per gallon. And it looks like it's working. I want to try it again and put in different numbers. So 789, and I use 26 miles, should be around 30 miles to the gallon, and it is. No, I don't want to run it again. So like I said, that's a nice little routine. And the only thing that's left is to do our display results. So let's quick write that one. I don't need that alert anymore because that's what the display results routine does. I'm just going to break it up over three lines, but I don't have to do that. But It doesn't have to, but otherwise, if you don't put it in, you'll get something like 30.567318. You know, and having it to two decimal places just looks a little nicer. that's that routine. Again, now I can save it, run it, and just make sure it works. What did we put in before? I was like 786 and 30, and there it is. All right. And that, literally, that's, that's the whole program. And to be honest with you, that was originally going to be your test or one of the problems on your test, and it's not going to be now. You don't have to raise your hand and say, well, why not? But uh, no, it's not going to be one of the ones on your test. But you will have a problem at least somewhat similar to that one. But what I wanted to get you to is I don't want it where, oh, I'm going to pull this out. No, I want you to use your own intellect because you're all able to do this. <clears throat> Is there anything on this example that we went over that doesn't make sense to anyone? You know, in the past I've had people say, you know, it makes a lot of sense when you do it like this, but then when I try to do it, it doesn't make any sense. And I understand that. If I could figure out a way to fix that, I would write a book on that and make myself a lot of money and I wouldn't teach anymore. I'd move someplace where it's warm all the time. And golf. All right. But that's, that's just the way it is. You know, sometimes it's like I, I even said to people, I'd love to be able to just sit there and open up your brain and just get a sledgehammer and pound all this stuff in so it makes sense to you. Everybody learns it differently. You all have to learn it in your own way. That's all I can tell you.
sledge looking. We gotta get a new roller or something on there. So. Last chance, any questions on this one? Is there anything that doesn't make sense? It's say what? We're going to look at now another way of doing this. I have a question for you. All right? And it's going to sound like, why would you ask a question like that here? So can somebody tell me? Give me a definition. What is an alias? No, no. I'm just saying, gener generically, generally, what's an alias? Another name. Yeah, it's another name for something, right? Okay. Well... What we're going to do in this program is we're going to use an alias in our code that almost all JavaScript programmers use. Why would we want to do that? <clears throat> because instead of having to use this get element by ID and making possibly making a chance, we're going to create an alias for that. And it's going to be a dollar sign. And that's going to handle everything for us. All right, so we'll end up writing a lot less code that way. So typically when you write an alias like that, it's because it'll simplify your code. And in this case, it's really going to simplify your code. This first page, <clears throat> the top page and what I'm giving you right now, the top page, you have that right. You've got that whole file. Second page on here, you don't have. And again, if, if anyone still is having problems or you think you typed it incorrectly and it's not working or whatever, all right, 
okay? That's, it's, not a, it's not a problem. You don't have to turn this in and you have the code. You'll be able to go back and take a look at it. All right, if you do that, you take a look at it, you still can't figure it out, send me what you have or whatever, and I'll be happy to take a look at it for you. All right? The only other thing to mention, and this is what Amin had asked about before, was this on the bottom right here, this. All right? So this section that you see right in there in gray right now, that produces the prompt on your screen that says, do you wish to run the program again? Okay? And then it defaults to Y for yes. Okay? <clears throat> then whatever they put in goes into this variable called wanna. So if I put yes I do, then all of yes I do would go in there. That makes sense? But all I care about is the first character, the one we call first. So I say go through whatever they typed in for this wanna and grab the character at location zero, since we're a computer, that's our first location, and automatically convert it to uppercase. So if we put in a little y, it'll now become a big y. So whatever, whatever if we put in any alphabetic character in there, it doesn't matter what it is, we're going to grab the first one and make it uppercase. And then we say, if it's not equal to y, again is equal to false. Otherwise, again, is equal to true. So we're going to run it again. So if we put this in here, I'm just going to, whoops, I'm just going to accept all of the defaults. All right. And it says, do you wish to run the program again? This, whatever we type in here right now. Yes, I most certainly do. That right there that we just typed, that whole thing that we just typed in there, that is wanna. Then what we're going to do is we're going to grab just the first character, and let's make it lowercase, <clears throat> and we're going to make that, upper, we're going to uppercase that first character only. So this right here, that char at says grab that character and make it uppercase. So in other words, that character will now look like this. Does that make sense? And then we're, we're basically saying if it's anything other than that Y, stop the program. So yes, I certainly do. Notice it runs again. But if I go through and again now say, no, I do not. It doesn't care. It's just grabbing that first character. It's uppercasing it. It's checking, oh, it's not a Y. So stop the program run. All right? Does all that make sense? All right. So let's look at this next example. <clears throat> it's the second handout that I gave you. And this is what it is on the screen right here. That's what you have. That's the first page. In fact, if I right mouse click on here and I choose view page source, that's exactly what you have right in front of you. Let's look at it, but let's look at it a little bit bigger so it, it's a little easier for us to read. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. All right. All right, so again, what I have on the screen is exactly what you have. Okay? There's our doc type, our HTML tag, our head tag, our meta tag, our title tag. Here we're adding, I just put a reset in there. We didn't have to do that, but I put a reset in. I've got my own style sheet that we'll look at in just a minute. And we're adding the JavaScript right there. So I'm asking you this question right here. Is there anything in there in blue? that doesn't make sense to anyone as far as what we're doing. Again, the idea is what we want to be able to do, if you look up on the screen here, let me grab, uh, what we want to do is this is the finished product. Looks the same, right? Except now if I put in, what was it, 786, and I put in 30, and I click calculate, there's my result. 
okay? If I click clear, it clears and it puts my cursor right back there. If I put in something non-numeric for miles, it still gives me this, all right? And then it asks me to do it again. So I put in something numeric, whoop, I click calculate and it says the gallons is now non-numeric. So I put in something there, I click calculate and it all works. Does that make sense? But now what we're doing is we're combining, rather than having an unbelievably simplistic little HTML file that has just a button on it, now we're incorporating all this stuff into an actual HTML form. All right, that's typically the way that this stuff is going to be used. So that's what I want to show you. So let's take a couple of minutes and go over this file, just a couple, and then take some more minutes and go over the JavaScript. The good news is the actual logic for the JavaScript is the same as the stuff you just looked at. As far as you want to check to make sure what you put in is numeric, so we'll have that while loop like we did before to make sure for our input validation and another input while loop input validation, one for the miles driven, one for the gallons used. We'll figure out the, the, the formula the same way. Miles driven divided by gallons used. And do a two fixed to two decimal places on it. All right, so none of that stuff will change. Now, if we do look at this, I'm going to bring this up on the screen right now. You don't have this. I guess I could have printed it out for you. If you wanted, I can really print it out, but I didn't want to print it out plenty anyway. I say so I put in some stuff for the body for the coloring. I put this in a container. There is the header. There is the H1 tag in the header. There is the other H1 tags. There is our button. There is our label. There is any input tag. There is where our miles per gallon is going to go. I wanted to be able to center some stuff. And uh, our A tag, our A tag hovering. I think I took the image out. I had an image in there originally. I think I took it out, so you don't even need that. For the submit button, I don't know why that's in there twice. Okay. Some of the stuff I put in there, I wanted to be able to use the same CSS file for this one and the next one I'm going to show you in a couple minutes. All right. So let's look at the actual... J JavaScript. Does it also make sense to everyone that this now, you should all understand that's how you should be creating your applications. You should have your source code, then you should have a JS folder with your JavaScript, and a CSS folder with your CSS files. If you have images, you should have an images folder with your images. There might even be other stuff depending on what you're doing. Maybe you're doing some special stuff with fonts or whatever. All right, but let's look at the actual JavaScript. This is what you don't have, but you have the hard copy of it now. All right, now, again, Project 3.7, version 1. That look familiar? Exact same stuff we had before. All right, here is where I asked you about this. Rather than saying document.getElementById, all right. What I'm saying is I want to make an alias and I want the dollar sign to mean document.getElementID and whatever we pass in there is this. Now, I'm not saying does that make sense because that might make very little sense to you. But again, it's an alias. It's saying that instead of having to type in every time document.getElementID followed by something, now I just have to put dollar sign followed by something. And it'll expand it into that. Yes? No, you, you, this, no this, there's, there's nothing special about this. I mean, I could put, I, I, could, I could have called this if I wanted to, for example, uh, G-E-B-I, for get element by ID. And if you have another one for tags, you could do it the same way. So if you were going to be using tag names, you could use dollar sign. You could use whatever you wanted to. The, the, the dollar sign is typically the one that's used because more often than not in JavaScript, you're using get element by ID. All right? And not only that, that's pretty much the way you do it in jQuery also. 
That's why JavaScript just basically ripped it off. So there's not a different one for that? No, there's not. You could make one again if you wanted to, but no, there's not. Okay? All right. So now notice in here, and again, I'm not saying to you, hey, does this totally make sense? Because I gave you a program where part of the stuff that's in here is out of Chapter 5. Well, we haven't gone over Chapter 5 yet. That's why it might not make sense to you. All right? But this is writing and actually using document object model stuff in it. So this is saying, hey, you've got this thing called miles. All right? And I want you to basically go over to this. I want you to go over to, oh, I want you to go over this and grab what's in there. Does that make sense? That's now miles. All right. This is now gallons. Does that make sense? All right. And you may or may not be able to tell on here, this is a little gray. All right. I made that a, a read-only field. Why did I do that? Why is that field read-only? So you can't change it. You know, I, I, you, it's the same kind of thing in a calculator. If I say 6 plus 3 equals, it gives me 9. It doesn't let me change that number. I don't want it to be 9. I want it to be 53. I can't do that. So if I put in a, a valid value here and here, and I click calculate, that value cannot be changed. I can clear it out and put in new values. But if I put in here 110, that's going to be 10.00 always. And I can't change that. Does all that make sense? All right. Because a lot of, of, of the work that was in here was, was just taking this program and getting it to look halfway decent on the screen. And it sure as heck is not perfect. I, don't, I wouldn't lie to you and tell you that it is. But what you have in front of you, if you're interested in using it, is you now and, and again, I, I probably should have done that, so I'll, I'll do that for tomorrow. I'll print off the uh, JavaScript or the CSS also. All right? If you want to use something like this and possibly make modifications to your um, portfolio that you're hopefully working on when you get a chance. All right? It's something that you can use for it. Again, do you have to do that? You say, oh, I'm, I've already got my own stuff. Then use your own stuff. That's totally fine. It's not a, not a problem whatsoever. But I know that sometimes people struggle. They can't get stuff to line up. They don't understand colors or whatever. So this is something you could use if you wanted to. All right? So let's take a look at the, the magical code that's in here that makes it work. Hopefully one thing you realize, if I, I'm going through the whole code now. I'm on line 11. Boom, 65. So what does that mean? It means there's about 50 lines. You may or may not have realized it, but what we just wrote had about, I think it was over double that, the first one that we did. So we cut down the number of lines of code by a lot. Also, please look up on the screen here. I'm just quickly paging through this. Do you notice one word that's not used in here at all? The word while? Now we are checking it every single time. And now it works like this because of the way the program was written. In English, what we're saying is grab that value. All right, grab that value that we put in there, the first, the, the first text box, and call it miles. Grab the value that we put in for the second text box and call it gallons. Then validate them both. If for some reason... You know, you don't like it or whatever. Now, if you may or may not have noticed this, but if I grab this now, if I run this, I'm going to put in junk on purpose. All right, see what that does? Everybody see that? It gives me the error, and it puts me there. Everybody, everybody cool with that? Well, if I wanted to, I could have come in here. I, this should work. Now, no matter what luck I have, it probably won't, but this should work. 
Um, let's see. I'm going to put in another line here. What should this line do? What should that line do? The one that's in gray that I just put in. What should that do? What? No. What, what does it say, though? It says equals double quote, double quote. So what are we doing? If you still don't get it, let's run the program again. Okay, error message. We removed that bad input. Sometimes you want to do that and remove it to make it easier for the user. Sometimes you don't want to because you want them to be able to look at whatever it is they put in there. So ideally, at least, they learn from their mistakes and they get the error and now we're leaving them here. Now they're responsible for removing whatever garbage was in there. Does that make sense? All right. So we, you see that we have really taken the code that we have and we have cut down the size of it a lot. So we do this, we come through here first and we check. And remember this word? That word that says return, okay? So if this was bad, we do this, all right? We clear it out and we return. If it's not bad, now it holds a value for miles, but we're still returning. Because now we're gonna do the same thing for the second one. And now, once it looks okay, all right? And we'll go over the syntax in just a minute. Now we're telling it, call calculate miles per gallon. Hey, does this look familiar, this line right here? It's the exact same line we had before. This is just a clear function. We'll talk about that in a minute, all right? But we're just going to print out all the stuff. So let's take a look at where it's different. We kind of looked at where it's the same. The constants are the same. We already looked a little bit at this. This right here, just so you hear the verbiage, what you see in gray right there at the top of the screen is called an anonymous function. Anybody want to take a guess as to why it's called anonymous? What, after the word function, what doesn't it have? It doesn't have a name. So if you write a, a function in JavaScript that's an unnamed function, it's also known as an anonymous function. All of the functions that we've done so far have been named functions. But the idea is if I'm only gonna call this a few times, I end up typically writing a lot less code by using anonymous functions. The other thing that you're able to do here, this is cool whether you realize it or not right here, is notice what it says here. This looks a little, whoops, this might look a little funky. Everybody see this? Does that look like it looked before? Before we said function main, correct? Now we're saying var main equal function. You can use functions in JavaScript like they were variables. That's what we're doing here. Main is now both a function and it's a variable. And again, you might, well, that's fine. Why would you ever want to do that? Because now anything that you do to a variable, you can do to main. You, you provided a lot more power. That's the good news. What's the bad news? It's harder to understand. I want my warm and fuzzy back. I want, I want these name functions. They're much easier. What I'm telling you is that when you're writing code, you can typically write it either way. But if you're interacting with HTML directly, you almost always do it this way. But I wanted to show you the name functions first because that's the way you do it in virtually any non-JavaScript programming language. There are other languages that are now allowing you to do this and have, have these name functions, unnamed functions. Sometimes they call them unnamed functions. 
I think Swift calls them closures. It depends on the language that you're using, all right? The other thing you may or may not have realized is, doesn't this look a little funky here? Since it's a variable name, so var equal function, and then the function has to be within curly braces. Why is this on the end? You actually should know the answer to this question. Why is that? Because it's still a variable. And all variables must end with a semicolon. All right? So once we get into chapter five, we'll talk about this again. And we'll go back to the calculator program one last time, and we'll write it. But when we write it, we'll make it look more something like this. It'll look like an actual calculator. All right? And what we'll have in there is unnamed functions to do the work that we want to have done. Now, again, that's, I mean, it's a new mindset for you. It's something you probably haven't seen before, et cetera. It may make little or no sense to you, but you're going to have to look at it and start to understand it. All right, you won't need this for your next test. You'll need this for the test for Chapter 5. All right, so we'll have a combined test on 5 and 6. And that won't be for a few weeks yet, a couple weeks. All right, but then you'll need to understand it. Now, we look at, again, we can pass things to it. It's just a function, but since it's an unnamed function, we can, we can give it parameters like we did here. Still have the semicolon. This right here, I want to go over these last two. This actually, believe it or not, this is a really easy function. Now, you might say, yeah, it's easy for you to say, but it really and truly is an easy function because all we're doing Value is what appears inside of the text box. So we're saying blank out the first text box, blank out the second text box, blank out the third text box. So what that's going to do is it's going to say blank out whatever is in here, whatever is in here, and whatever is in there. Does that make sense? How about this one? What does this line do? That line, the line 59. It puts your cursor into the first box. Why not make it as simple as possible for the person to run the program? You know, I, I've read books before where they've actually said this. This isn't a joke. Assume the person running your program is an idiot. And, and by assuming that they're an idiot, what you're doing is you're trying to make sure that whatever it is you tell them to do, you make it as hard for them to screw up as possible. Not to say they still can't screw it up, but you're making it as hard for them to screw up as possible. And this last one right here, this is the hard one. This is the one you might struggle with the most. All right? This on load means once the program gets loaded into the memory of the computer. All right? Then what it says here is when you click the button that's called calculate, so there's a button in here that's called Calculate. When you click it, what we're associating with it is main. Okay? What's missing after main? What's not shown after main? What do we, what do we always put after the name of a function? Parentheses? If we put parentheses there right now, it would literally call it right then. We don't want it to be called. We're doing an association right now. We're saying, when you, when you click that button, call that routine. When you click that button, call that routine. Does that make sense? So on, We're doing, for lack of better words, an association. What's that? So on load just means like when, you're, is that like when something's clicked on? Or <coughs> no. Is that the on, click? on load means when the program has been loaded into memory. <coughs> what you're going to see in the next example is it'll look a little different than this one because this example is doing it using JavaScript 
and I went back finally and recreated the same exact program using jQuery. All right? Now, if there is a shame about this class, and I don't mean shame, I mean if there's something that's kind of sad about this class, is that we literally have no time to go over jQuery. At the school I used to work at, they had a whole class they had to take in jQuery. But it was not set up, you know, where you had four classes like you have here. I am going to talk to Evan during the break, and we're going to talk about the future as far as what kind of classes we want to offer, etc. Things may change. All right. By the time, not, not for you guys, you'll, you'll still take the four courses I told you about. <clears throat> but by the time, uh, maybe it might even take two years, I'm interested, for example, the ASP.NET class you take, it's going to be a great class. I don't mean because I teach. I mean nothing like that. But it's good because there's a lot of stuff for you to learn. I'm not sure if ASP.NET is what you should be learning. So I'm going to make my case to him. You may have heard that one of the new, newer lang fairly new languages that's very popular right now is Python. And I wouldn't mind seeing that class become a Python class. Now, I might tell that to him, and he might say, well, I'm in charge, and no. Okay. Then it doesn't become one. Does that mean we never offer a Python class? No. Like I said, if I can offer a class during the summer, I'd like, I'd like you to choose what you'd like it to be. Now, if you say, I'd like it to be hardware, I'd like to learn hardware, fine. Then you have somebody else teach it. So I'm not the one to teach you hardware. I'm not. There, there is a, a presentation tonight at, I think it's called Fort Zumwalt. It's a uh, junior high or high school that's around here someplace. And um, I volunteer to go if they need. It's on STEM. If you've never heard of the, the, ver the STEM is an acronym. It stands for science. What is it? Science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's all the this, all this stuff in IT and other areas put together. And it's typically they have sixth and seventh graders there. And Charles said he brings over a really a, a older machine that he has. And he has the students literally put RAM into the machine and take it out and stuff. And I, I told him how I volunteered to come. And I, and I told him this morning, I said, Charles, if that's what you're going to do, I don't want to come anymore. And he's like, he just starts to laugh. He goes, why? I said, because I'm not the person to teach hardware. All right. But again, Brady's question was a good one. This says when the onload function is called automatically by the system. We want this function to run. What that function does is it says, okay, what we, we're doing now is we're taking that button right there and we're associating it with calling that routine. We're taking that button right there and we're associating it with that routine. And we're saying, since we're just starting the program, again, set the focus to the first text box. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to say anymore, hey, does that make sense to you? Because, you, you know, again, you might think, yeah, Claire is mod. Okay? But it's something that you have to at least be exposed to. When we write the actual calculator program, when we rewrite it and make it look like a real calculator, this is the way we're going to write it. We're going to put some stuff in there that you haven't seen yet, but this is the way that we're going to do it. This is the best way of writing code when you're trying to combine the use of what we did before, what, I, what, I, what I've been showing you before. Would you agree that in the first example, um, that button really didn't matter very much? I mean, our interface was just, uh, was it, for lack of better words, it was a stupid interface. It's not anymore. All right. It's 10. What I'm going to do is I'm very quickly going to give you the last handout, all right, and we're going to talk about it for about five minutes, then we'll take another break. This last one, I'll only talk to you about it for probably about 15 or 20 minutes, all right? And like I said, I realize if you say, wow, you know, this is, Jeff, you know, I like the class, you're not that bad, but this is a hell of a lot to throw at us. Yes, it is. All right. Now, this last one, we're, we're, the first page is exactly the same. I didn't even really have to do it. But what we've changed in here in this last one is that we're writing it and we're using jQuery, which is a JavaScript library. And again, 
I'll go over it with you. You may have to take some time. I would strongly suggest that if you get some time, that you go back and actually do this in yourself. All right? Because you learn so much more when you're keying in stuff and you make mistakes. That's the best way to learn. Everyone should have three handouts. Okay. I want to run this program one more time before we talk about it and talk about it's not a problem, but if I run this program, okay, again, not the best looking interface, but not a bad looking interface. I think you'd agree with that. Again, it could probably be lined up a little bit better. The buttons maybe, or this should be moved. It doesn't matter. We could do that with CSS. All right? But the point is, when I do this, that's kind of amateurish. Alerts are ugly. Most people don't read them. Most end users don't read them. You go, wow, I don't know if I've ever seen an alert. There's a reason for that. All right? Now, this last one that I just gave you, please take a look up on the screen here. Close a couple of these. Do you notice something that looks different right away? Anybody see anything that looks different? Asterisks. You've got those asterisks, meaning that they're required fields. We could have even put a message up there saying there were required fields. All right? But now notice what happens. See the difference? All right? When I clear, Still clears them out, but now if I put in some stuff that's out of range, okay, that's an interactive program. And it's probably the first time that we've been working here where we've got a program that's truly interactive. All right. Why? Because that's typically, if you were writing a website for someone and they wanted interactivity, this is the way you do it. All right. So I want to take a few minutes. It's 10.04, maybe till 10.10 or so, and we'll go over what's in this program, okay? Then we'll take a break. Maybe it'll take till 10.15, I don't know, but till around 10.30 or so. Then we're going to come back, and we're going to totally shift gears, and I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow. Now, you're sure Valerie won't be here tomorrow either? She would be. Okay. Well, the reason I'm asking is you guys are the teachers tomorrow. We're having, we're having other students come in here, and you, you're going to all teach. I get to just sit here and screw off. And I can do that really well, all right? I've learned that over, over time. And you're going to be graded on the job you do. The good news is you all passed. As long as you come, you're all going to pass. But I'm going to give you extra points if you do a good job. Yes? How old are these kids? I don't know. I don't know how many are coming. There might only be one. Right now, when I heard last week, there was only one. I, I don't know. I really don't know if they're, I, if they're high school kids. I don't know if they're people. They have a thing here that's called Shadow of Tech. Uh, okay. And that's what it is. I, asked, I, I was talking to Charles last week, and I said, what do you do for this? And he said, well, you can kind of do what I do. And I said, what's that? He said, talk about the program for a couple minutes. Tell them the class is in charge and turn it all over to them. And I said, I can handle that. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. The good news is you have all the code. And I'm going to even give them the code. So, and so, so what, what do we do? No, that's up to you. That's how you're being graded. You can make this as interactive with them as you want it to be. Typically, the more interactive, the better. We'll talk about that after we take our break. All right? So let's talk about this right here. And again, if you didn't understand the last one, chances are probably pretty good you won't understand this one very well. And it's okay. The good news is, everybody agree? Please look up on the screen here. Oh, this is the old one. I was going to say this looks way too. Uh, no, I don't want to change that. So let's open up that last one. <coughs> I think this is it. 
Yes, it is. All right. Anybody remember, I talked about this, and this is Chapter 5. Anybody remember what this stands for? No, it's, not, it's not short for your name, Dominic. No. Document object model. Good. Yeah. That's what this program uses. That's what jQuery uses is the document object model. That's why when you work with a document object model, anything that you might want to manipulate with code, you give it an ID. All right? And because IDs have to be unique. And then you can use this puppy with it, the dollar sign. All right? So again, let's, let's talk about what's different in here. We don't have to talk about the constants because we already did. We don't have to talk about this because we already did. All right? This looks pretty familiar. That pretty much is set up the way that the last one was, pretty much. What's new is this. See, node value, first child, node value. I will tell you that probably the hardest thing in this class, period, is the document object model. But I know people who understand the document object model. They're not even that great of programmers, but they really get the document object model. They're more in demand than good programmers are. Because if you can understand, and, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to sound like an infomercial here, I'm really not. But if you can harness the power of using the document object model, there's very little with websites you can't do. You will get better over time. You will get better at setting up web pages. You will, because practice doesn't make perfect, but pra practice makes better. All right? You will get better at writing CSS. You will notice patterns and things that you do, and, well, I think I can do this, or I can use this. Maybe I can use this cascading style sheet I already used and modify it or whatever. You'll get better at JavaScript. But you have to understand how all of them work in conjunction with the document object model. All right? And I think I mentioned this to you before. I'm, I'm not going to go nuts with this at all, but I'm just going to go here to w3schools.com. And I know that under their tutorials, <clears throat> at least they used to, there's XML DOM. That's not the one. Okay, let's go. All right. So it's the idea that every one of these elements that you see in there could, in essence, have its own ID. So when you work, whether you're using just JavaScript or you're using jQuery, and all jQuery is, is it's a JavaScript library. Now, anything that, that's in here that you've got an ID set up for, you can now manipulate programmatically. That's the power of using the document object model. So if you get a chance, and again, when people lie, I don't have time to do all this stuff. Yeah, you know what? You are making a two-year investiture in your life in doing this. You're spending a boatload of money, all right? Where I used to work at, at Blackhawk, courses were $1,200 a piece, okay? And you, well, why, why the big difference? Well, you had to take more of them. So you ended up paying pretty much what you pay here but you're getting, in one class, what they got there typically in three classes. Yeah, and you're getting a lot thrown at you in a small amount of time. Ideally, at least, from listening to what you all said about your, your uh, communications class, at least you're, hopefully you're having more fun in this than you are in there. All right? I'm not going to say any more than that, other than I did mention it to Charles, and uh, I didn't say any names or any, I didn't say anything that anybody said. He just said that what... If, if you are having any problems with any teacher, including me, you should always go to the teacher first, but if you think either we did or, and, and he or she didn't listen or there's no way I can, then you should go. I don't know if you know Shannon. Her office is right next to mine, but I can arrange. She's the one who came in here that one day. But I can arrange for her to come in here if you want. And I'm not, I'm not saying do you want that, but if you do, let me know. And so if you have a problem with me, that's what you should do. If you have a problem with any teacher, that's what you should do. From what I understand, that the, the one person who's teaching you, it's their first year here as a teacher. 
and I have no idea if they have experience. I don't have any idea, but I do know that the person who used to be your teacher for all those classes retired last year. And from what I hear from other people, it's a shame because you would have loved that person. Everybody did, but they just retired. All right. So if that's the case, just email me. That's the easiest way to do it. If, I mean, if you continue to have problems, but try to talk to the instructor first. All right. I would ask you to do the same thing with me. But again, you go through this. This is a tutorial. They walk you through what the DOM is. And it just walks you through a screen at a time. There's your document.get element by ID. And if you go, well, that doesn't look, you told us about that. No, it's not going to show you the shortcut. But it's going to show you this and how it's used. I have no idea how big this is. I've gone through this. It was so many years ago. I can't tell you how many years ago it was. Probably four or five years ago. And have they upgraded it since then? They may have, but it probably is basically the same tutorial. All right. So if you don't like that one, there, you know, just type, you know, key in DOM tutorial. You're going to find a lot of them. A lot of them will be good. A lot of them will be very much probably over your head. All right. And I'm sure there's some, plenty of them in there that are over my head. So when you do this, this stuff again is the same. We've got a, a, a flag here that's called is valid. Now we're assuming stuff is valid. We're assuming that everything that gets keyed in is valid. But if we find out it's not, we set is valid to false. We're only going to go and call our routine that's going to figure out the miles per gallon if that flag is set equal to true. Does that make sense? And we have opportunities to set it to false if either, if either we put something non-numeric or we put something in that's out of range. Otherwise, that's our error area right there. We put nothing in there because there was no error. All right? If there was, we either put miles must be numeric or we put miles must be between 1 and 1,000. And you should know that by now that... Those messages that you saw non-numeric, that was this one, out of range, that was this one. So all that code is what's, so all the code that you see here, that's all of our mile stuff. You can see all of it in one crack, so you can see every bit of it. And all the code that's here, that's for our gallon stuff. The way that the document object model works, and I don't want to go into it in much detail now because it's chapter five, all right, is when you look at the stuff that we looked at in here before, this. Let me back up. Where's that picture? These in here are all known as nodes, N-O-D-E-S. They're all known as nodes. And nodes can have other nodes under them or nothing under them. If there's nothing underneath the node, it's called a leaf node. It's reached the bottom. So it's kind of like you might, you know, trees, well, they've reached their leaves. All right. These happen to be nodes, so, so the root element here is both a child of the document and it's a parent of the head and the body and it's a grandparent of these and a great-grandparent of these. Does that make sense? You don't typically talk about it and use aunts and uncles, etc. Typically you talk about parents, children, and you might talk about grandparents. But you typically, because otherwise it gets to be a little weird, all right, that when you talk about that stuff, okay? But we were looking at nodes. And as they mentioned here, I don't want to read this to you. You can use JavaScript to basically manipulate anything that's in here that has an ID associated with it. And even some stuff that doesn't. What does that mean? That means that if I wanted to, for instance, in this thing that we just looked at, I could have... Let, let, let's say that what I wanted to do was... Uh, once you put in a, a miles here, that let's say 300, and once you put in a gallons here, let's say 10, and once you click calculate, all right, you can see what happens. It worked. But if I wanted to, 
I could have not had any of this thing in here with the MPG. Once you put in something valid, I could have put in, let's say, an unordered list that I built that had everything in increments of 50. You know, 50 with this miles per gallon, 100 for this, except I could have built an unordered list and I could have done that using JavaScript or jQuery. And that's the interactivity. Okay, so this is a, this is a totally interactive program. Okay, the only way we could have had it be less interactive is if we would have had values in here and we would have run it without you having to enter anything. But think about it. You know, if I, if I use the calculator on my phone, the calculator on my phone, it's an interactive calculator, right? It, wouldn't you agree with that? But I still have to put numbers in there and tell the system what I want it to do. So when you look at this, and I've already gone over, but when you look at this, this is what we're going to be looking at. Node value and the children. Okay? There's not only is there a first child, but there's a first child, there's a last child, and there's a next child. And there's a previous child. So these are all things that we're going to look at when we get up to chapter five of the book. Again, like I said, probably that'll be the hardest thing that you find in this semester will be that will be that chapter. All right. Chapter six is on forms. You already know how to make those. But we're going to talk about how you can go and validate different things in forms using JavaScript. All right. And seven and eight will just add on to the stuff we've talked about. So it's 1018, let's come back at 1030, and then we'll talk about what we're going to be doing tomorrow. All right? Bootstrap to CSS, what jQuery is to JavaScript, in terms of like a library that you kind of like. I, I, uh, that's not a bad sense. analogy. Yeah, I'd say, it, I'd say it's similar, but the idea is to, to really create good looking interfaces takes some talent. Right. All right. And many web developers don't have the talent to consistently create good looking interfaces. So they use okay? jQuery. No, so they or use Bootstrap. That's, that's why Bootstrap, more than anything else, that's why Bootstrap was created. Yeah. And what they did was they basically said, okay, let's, let's make our own CSS library and basically put it on steroids, you know, and it's put everything that we can, we can think of in there. Yeah. And, yeah, so I'd say in some ways at least, yeah. Right. So the idea is if, if you can understand all those components, you're a valuable commodity to a company. But... Let's face it, these companies that are going to hire you, they're not stupid. They're, they're going to be like, you know, well, Brady did this. It's, this, is, this is pretty good. He did this portfolio. He used Bootstrap, and it's pretty good. But and then you start looking at your code, and they go, wow, he could have done this, and he could have done this, because he's just learning. Right. And they understand that stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit there, and when I teach you this stuff, I'm not going to sit there and teach you shortcuts right away. Right. Because it's like... You want to learn the basics. You better first. learn the basics first. Yeah. Again, it's the old learning division, then doing, yeah. you know, long division, short division type of type of an idea. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I'd say it's not it's a pretty good analogy. Okay. I was curious because I mean, I've, I've been told that I mean, <coughs> like, yeah, if it's a different language, I'm like, well, I mean, it's kind of not because like no. I don't know. The the funny thing is, there is there is still. As far as I've been able to find, there's not a really good book out about Bootstrap. And part of the reason for that is all the ones that consider themselves pretty good books 
all they do is they replicate the stuff that's in the bootstrap site. Right. Because I've looked up, I've looked up things online to see if there's anything that would like go with that, but I didn't get anything out of it. What? And, and even if you Google creating a whole website using Bootstrap, they don't. They don't. What they need to do, and I've thought of doing this, and I might. I might pitch this to um, these people at Muroc because they haven't gotten back to me. But asking them if they'd be interested in having a book where we would first, the whole book would be creating a website, the whole book. Right. We'd create the HTML, then we'd do the CSS, then we have the JavaScript for interactivity. It'd be the first part of the book. Second part, we'd recreate it using Bootstrap and jQuery. The same thing. That's, yeah, that's, that'd be really helpful, actually. Because, I mean, you're seeing two sides to doing it. Yeah. So it's easier. And, right. You know, and I got to just come up with the time to, to draft that letter. The bad thing is, I don't know if the company that I've been working with, this Mirac, would be the best for that because they're they're ranking, they're very set in their ways. Yeah. They, for instance, when when you write, you, you'll notice this because that's the book that we're going to use next fall. Okay. They use the word "you" all the time. You you will find you will this you will, I don't like I don't like that. Right. Better watch what I'm saying because I'm probably if they ever hear yeah. this. Yeah. I love their books. I do, and I'm not saying that because it's being taped. I, I, didn't, I didn't stop taping. But they told me when I I, I sent them in because I'm I'm doing a C plus plus book for them, right. and when I yeah. send in the first chapter, it's like you're not writing enough in Muroc style. Right. And they have a 400 page book how to write a Muroc book book. Well, first and, then and, and next semester, down. now are you talking C++ or are you talking C Sharp? Um, C++, I have a book up, and then okay. I know we're learning C Sharp. Yeah. And that's what but I think that the, the transition from C Sharp to C++ won't be a big one. Right, yeah. That's why I figured it'd be better for me to wait and yeah. then learn that. But. And judging by the way people are in here, I, I don't think that by and large, because people seem to at least be picking up the stuff in here, the programmatic stuff, Again, it's one thing to understand, and it's another thing to be able to apply it, you know, and I understand that, so.